Wednesday, we will have our normal evening prayer at 6.30. It will still be online on Zoom and Facebook Live, but we will also be doing it outside. And the reason why we're going to have it outside is that at the end of the service, we can have the burning and blessing of the palms. The ashes from the burning of those palms will then be used for our Ash Wednesday service the following week. So please feel free to join us outside for that uh, service on Wednesday at 6.30 for our evening prayer. We now begin our service with thanksgiving for holy baptism. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our light, and our salvation. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. So let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning, your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. <clears throat> Through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery to freedom. At the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water your word you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. And so we praise you for the gift of water that sustains life, and above all, we praise you for the gift of new life that is in Jesus Christ. So shower us with your Spirit, and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The prayer of the day. Everlasting God, you give strength to the weak and power to the faint. Make us agents of your healing and wholeness, that your good news may be made known to the ends of your creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from the 40th chapter of Isaiah, beginning at the 21st verse. Have you not known, have you not heard, what it is to be told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and inhabited, inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain, and spread them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely known, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows upon them and, there, and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom, then, will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who treated these. I'm sorry, who created these. He who brings out their hosts ennumbers them, calling them by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, and not one is missing. 
Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is everlasting God, the creator of the heavens of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. He understands is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youth will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. This ends the first reading. The second reading is from the first chapter of Mark, beginning at the 29th verse. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. He cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place and he prayed, and Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. And he answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came to do. And he went throughout Galilee proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Here ends the second reading. Grace, peace, and mercy to you all from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I remember about 20-some years ago falling and breaking a number of ribs. I was laid up for a number of days at home, unable to move without feeling severe pain shoot through my whole body. The pain meds that the doctor gave me didn't help much when it came to trying to do anything. It was impossible. But I do remember the first day that I finally began to feel a little bit better. Better enough, that is, that I was able to get up, go outside for a short walk. I walked a few blocks to the local grocery store where I bought a newspaper and some donuts. The sun was shining. And, the fir and for the first time in many days, I finally felt normal. I felt alive, and I felt whole. The next day, I felt better enough to go back to work and finally get work done that needed to be done. As I walked those three blocks, I realized, though, just how much I had taken for granted in my life. Things like walking, like being able to go to a store, Breathing on my own without crying and wincing in pain because of broken ribs. The healing that I eventually received freed me from the pain that I had that kept me homebound. But it also freed me to do all those things that I was not able to do, like going to work or doing the laundry or the dishes. The healing from these broken ribs freed me from my pain, and it freed me to live my life as I should. When Jesus heals us, he not only sets us free from those things that ail us and cause us pain in life, but he also sets us free to live our lives with a sense of purpose. In other words, Jesus' healing makes us whole again. It restores us. It renews us. Setting us free so that we can do the things that God has called us to do no longer holding us back because of physical or mental illness. For anyone who's ever been sick, you know how this goes. 
When you have a bad headache or a cold or the case of the flu, COVID or cancer, or maybe even a bout of depression, simply getting out of bed in the morning can be more than difficult. And even if we do drag ourselves into work, we are not going to be 100% effective. We won't be on top of our game. In today's gospel lesson, Jesus enters the home on the Sabbath day of Simon's mother-in-law, who was sick with a fever. Jesus then takes her by the hand and helps her up, and her fever left. Her illness is gone. We are then told that she began to serve Jesus and the disciples. Now before we say that this sounds awfully sexist, we need to recognize that, yes, 2,000 years ago, the work that Simon's mother-in-law was doing was all about taking care of the family and the home, serving and caring for family and friends. Because 2,000 years ago, if a woman was not able to fulfill that role, it would have been very humiliating for her. Those were just the social norms of the time. According to those social norms, her role and purpose in life was to take care of home and family. And if she couldn't perform those roles, do her job, she too would have felt useless. She would have felt as if she had no value. Just like any of us who, when feeling sick, may feel useless or of little or no value because we can't do our jobs or the work that we want to do. So Jesus enters her home, enters into her life, and heals her illness. He sets her free from that which was holding her back, from being the person that she had been called to be in her life, in her family, and within that community. Simon's mother-in-law, through Jesus' healing, is now restored, not only in the sight of her family and friends, but also now in the sight of the whole community as they gather around her house, seeing what Jesus is doing. As she is restored to physical health, she also regains her sense of purpose. She is once again able to do what she has been called to do, which is to serve others in the house. Now you've heard me speak before about this idea of vocation. And it comes from the Latin word vocatio, which means a calling or to be called. It's where we get our word vocal from. Now a vocation is more than just a job. It's a calling. It's the work that we believe God has invited us to do in life. But too often, though, this notion of a calling is often thought about as something that only pastors or nuns or monks or religious people get. But in reality, each and every one of us has a calling in life, a vocation. And until we're able to live out that vocation, that calling, I don't think we're ever going to be able to feel whole. We will not be the people that God has created us to be. Now, sometimes illness and sickness, mental health issues, and yes, even possessions by unclean spirits can prevent us from living out our God-given calls, as we saw with uh, Simon's mother-in-law. Our callings or vocations in life can change. Careers often change. I was an engineer for a while, but now I'm a pastor. Both careers, both vocations, I believe were callings. When we understand our, vaca our vocations, when we live out our calling in life, it will be a beautiful thing. When we truly live out our callings in life, we will feel fulfilled. We'll experience a sense of purpose. We will feel alive and whole. And others, I believe, will take notice of that feeling too. But when we find ourselves doing those things that we haven't really been called to do, I think we're going to feel as if something is missing in our lives. Sure, you might be getting rich doing that job that you really don't feel called to do. You may be seen as important or have power by others in that position that you're taking that you don't feel you really should be in. But money and power are not everything. So after this story... 
of Jesus healing Simon Peter's mother-in-law, we are told that all who were sick and possessed in that community were brought to Jesus by his disciples. The Greek word uses the word pharaoh, which means that the disciples actually physically carried those who were sick and possessed to Jesus. This is more than just posting a sign on the door of the house, inviting people to come and be healed. It's more than just going door to door, knocking on people's doors in the town, letting people know to come on over, Jesus will heal you. It's more than setting up a website or posting something on Facebook, letting people know of this healing service we're going to have on a Sunday morning. The disciples physically go out and carry all who were in need of Jesus' healing to the home where they could be healed. And this must have been a great deal of work and energy on the part of the disciples. But isn't that part of the calling of the church? That we, as Jesus' disciples, are also called to go out into the world in order that we can bring, we can carry people to Jesus? To bring people who are in need of healing and restoration into the church, into a relationship with Jesus, where they too can be restored and healed? Of course, all of this takes time and energy and resources. It takes a commitment on the part not only of Jesus, but also the disciples. These healings that Jesus imparts bring so much more than just the end to one's ailments, illness, or disease. The healings that Jesus does, the healing that we as a church have been called to do, actually restores people into their communities, their families, friends, and it restores their own sense of purpose and well-being. Being healed by Jesus is more than just having your ailment go away or your cancer enter into remission or your depression managed correctly. Because as we know, not all of us have had our ailments, our illnesses, our pains disappear after we've prayed or after we've come up to the altar for a laying on of hands or an anointing with oil. As strong as our faith and prayers may be, many of us continue to live with those illnesses we have. Being healed by Jesus has the power to heal us and also has the power to restore us and renew us so that we can live with our illnesses without being defined by our illnesses. And let me say that again because I think this is really important. Being healed by Jesus has the power to restore us and renew us so that we can live our lives without being defined by our illness. 2,000 years ago, if you were seen as sick or ill, that illness, that disease, that disability was actually seen as a punishment for some sins that you may have done. You were not just sick, you were unclean. There would be no more hugs, no more handshakes, no more visits by family and friend. People would actually cross the street as you walked by, afraid to catch whatever disease or uncleanliness you had, afraid also to be labeled as sick or unclean like you. But now, with Jesus healing and curing the sick and the possessed, they will now be allowed back into society. They will be able to have human contact once again with friends and loved ones. They will regain their sense of purpose in life. Healing by Jesus is much more than just a cure. It's life itself. I'm reminded of a video from back in the 1980s when Lady Diana came to visit America. She stopped in a hospital in New York that was treating people who had contracted HIV and AIDS. She hugged them. She, hooked, she shook their hands. She showed the world that these people were not to be defined as unclean or untouchable simply because they had AIDS and HIV. They were humans, just like anyone else, 
who, more than ever now, needed restoration. When Jesus, and when people like us, heal other people, we will find ourselves bucking conventional norms and understandings. We too may be looked down upon as sick and unclean. Healing certain people, bringing certain people for whom society often casts out, is not easy. It will be exhausting work. In the story before the sun rose, we hear how Jesus took off to find a quiet place to pray and to rest. Because healing people, caring for people, loving people, takes work. Yes, even for Jesus. To the point that even Jesus needed a time for rest and renewal. Now, these days, I think we're all hearing about the sheer exhaustion that doctors and nurses, caregivers and spiritual care providers on the front lines of this COVID pandemic are feeling. They are exhausted in hospitals and clinics, churches and nursing homes, often unable to find a break, some time off. And they too, the healers, the doctors, the nurses, the scientists, the spiritual care providers, they too need to be restored. If Jesus needed a break, if Jesus needed some time off, then surely we humans do too. Which is why being the church is never a one-person job. Because it takes everyone to share their God-given gifts, to bring healing to people. It's our vocation, our calling, to go out and heal those who are in need. So how do we heal people in need as the church? I think it's pretty simple, actually. First, we need to stop labeling people, which so often leads to judging other people. We need to see each and every person as the image of God and to treat them with love and respect. We need to be willing to touch those for whom society deems as sick and unclean. We need to walk alongside of them, to build relationships, to show others that we are not afraid. We need to welcome all people into this fellowship we call the church seeing the gifts that they can bring and allowing them to use and share their gifts among us and then to have a sense of purpose. We need to listen to one another, to really understand who we are and who others are, what they're feeling. Only then can we fully accept others. And finally, I think we need to humble ourselves to see in ourselves our own illnesses, those things from which we need healing for, and then let others heal us. When we can do these things, when we can live as Jesus lived and minister to one another as Jesus has ministered to us, then, my brothers and sisters, then we will be able to begin to live more fully into the good news of God's kingdom that Jesus has come to proclaim. Amen.
by Christ made known to the nations. Let us offer our prayers for the church, for the world, and for all those who are in need. The congregational response will be, let us pray, have mercy, O God. We pray for the church, for ministries of healing and wholeness, for hospital and hospice and military chaplains, for those serving in prison ministry, for all who proclaim freedom and release in the name of Christ. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. We pray for creation, for insects in the grass, for clouds on the mountaintops, for cattle and the rainwater that they drink. We pray for humility to take our place among all creatures of the earth. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. We pray for all nations, for all who lead in cities and towns, states and countries. We pray for community organizers, school officials, and CEOs. We pray for international health organizations that in times of trial, fear, and hopelessness, that they would find freedom in service to those most in need. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For all wearied by life's burdens, for those who are poor, for those lacking supportive relationships, for those crushed by debt, for those struggling with chronic pain or other sickness, for those exhausted from overwork or stress, and for all who cry out to you, we pray. For Lou, Lori, Betty, Anne, Mots, Peter, Jenna, Gina, Kelly, Eileen, Sarah, and all those we lift up in our hearts and aloud. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. We pray for this congregation of United Lutheran Church and for all our outreach and social ministries that are centered here, especially our Northside Food Pantry, our meal site in St. Patrick's, and for our senior center. We pray for parish nurses everywhere, for ministries of companionship and support, and for the young people in this place who open us up to new understandings. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. In thanksgiving for the faithful departed, who were called by name and now rest from their labors, especially Patricia, that their lives would serve as witnesses to the goodness of God. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, those spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Now let us pray together in the words our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the blessing. Neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit bless you all now and forever. Amen. Let us go in peace to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God.